Okay, hello everybody. This is Mike Reichenbach, uh, University of Minnesota Extension. I'm an extension educator in forestry working out of uh, the Cloquet office up near Duluth, Minnesota. And hello everyone, good morning. And I'm Becky Hagen Jokla, and I'm an extension educator in family resiliency with a focus on family resource management, financial management education. So finance is more my focus. I am also in the Cloquet Regional Office. Okay, and so what I wanna go ahead and do is, is kind of reiterate what Mark had said. This, this is more of a web meeting rather than a, the, than a or a Zoom meeting rather than a, a Zoom webinar. And so you'll all be able to participate uh, using using voice, um, and you can also use chat throughout this as well. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so you can see the presentation um, because we do have a few slides, not not a lot of slides, but we do have a few. And um, at this point, you should should be able to see that presentation now. Yep, looks um, looks good, Mike. Okay, um, and for everybody on there, I don't think we've got a, a large group. So, Mark, I, I, you know, it depends on how many we have when we get to the breakout session. We may not be doing breakouts. We may be just having discussion, which is which is fine. Um, but I want to be sure that everybody um, has had a chance to look at this curriculum framework, and it's at the the. Um, and I'll go ahead and put that into the um, the chat. Um, it's, it's curriculum framework handout. It has both this framework we'll be talking about plus some references on the back. Um, and now to, so what we'll be doing today is um, we've already into the introductions here over on, on the left part of the screen. We'll have a couple of polls that uh, Mark will go ahead and run. I'll talk a little bit about the uh, Becky and I both talk a little bit about the Minnesota Land Transfer Program and, and what that is, but we're really focusing on the context here of this program in terms of how do we reach out to families, and so, so that's kind of the context of what we're looking at is, is how do we work with families and, and the dynamics of, of families um, on different issues. Um, we'll talk about the collaborative curriculum framework. Um, then we'll get to some some breakouts, or we'll if there's not enough people, we'll just have a discussion. Um, we'll go ahead and have group reports, and and then a wrap up. And so with that, let's go ahead into these uh, polls, Mark. All righty, I'm going to launch that this now, and uh, I think we're just gathering some basic inf uh, some basic information from the participants on the call: your your location, your your pri primary role, and then also your primary content area. So I've launched that poll. Hopefully you should see that on your screen. And if you will, go ahead and submit your answers there. So Becky? Okay. Yeah. And, and thank you everyone for completing the poll and just taking a look at location. I see where there's representation from the Southeast, Midwest. In regard to roles, we have those that teach non-formal adult education and other And content area, financial education, consumer education, and forestry are represented. So thank you very much. Okay. So, um, so with that, we'll go ahead and, and um, talk a little bit about why the University of Minnesota is, is involved in, in forest land transfer and um, give you a little bit of background on, on how we began working with um, family and consumer sciences folks on, on this program. So in Minnesota, families own about a third of, of the woodlands. Uh, that's roughly about 5.3 5, 5 million acres. Uh, and what we know is if, if the land, as it's being passed down, gets sold at some point, it often gets subdivided, whether it's within that family or it gets sold to someone else, um, it, it's not maintained in a large tract. Um, University of Minnesota and, and other state agencies are interested in reducing the subdivision of these woodlands because of there, there's economies of scale for timber harvest and timber harvest su uh, supports some local economies. But uh, another reason is, is that larger parcels offer more opportunity for a wider range of wildlife and, and ecological function. 
And so we're, we're very interested in this, this con conservation legacy planning is, is what we're looking at um, from the forestry side. Um, how we address that is we offer a six hour workshop for both cabin and woodland owners on land transfer. Um, it differs a bit from kind of the farm, farm transfer programs and in farm transfer programs, many people who have a farm operation, um, for them that's a business and, and they're, they're much more interested in the financial aspects and the, and, and the succession plan for the business. Whereas uh, the woodland owners is typically not involved in a business or wouldn't consider themselves involved in a business and, and is interested in passing on kind of how they protect the land, that, that land management ethic to the next generation. So Becky? Yes, and in regard to the workshop, there are three key components that are a part of this. The first being communication. We found a very critical role in regard to helping families um, jumpstart their conversations in their families, the continuity of the land ethic, and legal and financial tools for transferring of land. And of course, if families do not talk, there's more of a risk that the land get subdivided. Okay, yeah, and so the, the image that you see is, is actually of um, a, a place in Wisconsin. It's, it's along the Brule River. It's an area that's been protected, but um, had it not been protected, we would have expected this river and the, the woodlands along it to be um, subdivided and, and lined with houses. So, so um, I want to give you some some background on, on what we've achieved with this six hour workshop um, and, and we really focus our program based on the, this ongoing experience of our participants. So it's, it's a it's a dynamic situation when we get into the, the workshop. Um, we have participants come in that have many different backgrounds and different experiences and different situations. And we try to make these workshops as hands-on as possible and adaptable to the dynamics of the families involved. And just real briefly on some of the numbers, we've, we've reached out to 206 people, uh, our families. Um, we average about 10 families per class. Um, and Becky, if you want to talk a little bit more about some of those other. Sure, sure. It's been so interesting in the different locations where we have held our workshops. And in some of our classes, they have included as many as 17 family members in, from one family. That was so interesting and amazing. From the evaluation survey, our participants have reported the following. One would be developing and updating a plan for passing the land on to the next generation. They also have reported increased communication and also land then being at a reduced risk from subdivision. But I want to just highlight the part about the next generation and back to the family member of 17 um, participants. Certainly they involved multi-generations which really helped uh, make a rich conversation in their communication process. Yeah, it's it's important, Becky, to note that we we when we promote this program, we we encourage entire families to come of multiple generations, and and often when we have people coming into the classroom to the workshop, um, this might be the first time the family has ever talked about what will happen to the land, and so um, it's an opportunity to begin a process of planning for the future. And, and that's what we're finding. And we'll talk a bit more about that in, in, you know, as, as we get into this. But um, we're, we're, in this presentation, looking at how do we look at the curriculum we use and continually improve it. Um, and, and, um, and so um, before I get into the, to, too much talking about what we do, uh, Mark, we've got another poll here on, on curriculum. Um, and what we're asking you to do is to pick a number on how you view curriculum, where one is, you know, curriculum's more of a noun. It's that printed document that you've got uh, that focuses on here's the purpose of why I'm teaching and here's the steps I'm going to take to do it. And, and at the other end of the scale at 10, um, curriculum's more of a verb. It's, it's that ongoing experience of engaging people in learning. So um, the poll is up. 
Yeah, I've, I've launched that and uh, folks should go ahead and log your results. So, of course. Okay, and we'll just take another 10 seconds. Ready? And I'm sharing those results now. Okay. So I, I know we've got small numbers out there, but there's there's you know a lot of folks that look at it kind of in between um, the two. You know, it, it sometimes it's that piece of paper that people use, and sometimes it's not. Um, for for several of for for maybe two or three of us, it's more of that ongoing experience, and so. The curriculum framework we're going to share today leans more toward the um, upper numbers on this scale. And, and so one of our purposes today is, is to maybe um, broaden our experience of curriculum. And I hope also to give everyone a, a tool to use, to, to take back and use in their, their own programs when they're teaching um, to help improve you know, their, their educational experience for participants. And so I'll talk a little bit here about the collaborative learning uh, framework. And, and this framework is comprised of, of six elements. There's uh, the, the educational purpose or the focus. Um, and then, then I spend a lot of time, or at least early in my extension career, thinking about, you know, what is it that I can bring to participants, kind of that expert knowledge. I was teaching a lot on skills-based things. I was teaching people how to plant trees or how to manage their forest. Um, as I moved into uh, teaching about things that were more complex and, and the teaching about passing the land to the next generation is, is inherently complex with different family dynamics, um, the, the role of, of Local knowledge, what are the participants' prior experience and, and how does that influence their learning? How does that family dynamic piece influence becomes really important? And I think we in Extension do a really good job of focusing on these three. Um, we want to bring in three more tools to this framework. Um, and, and those tools are dialogue, deliberation, and reflection. Um, I define dialogue um, as, as uh, the physicist uh, Bohm de defined it. it. It's really a, a stepping back and, um, you know, in the moment, listening to someone else, not bringing in your own thoughts to that, that or thinking about what you're going to respond to, but um, you're, you're, you're entering into this dialogic process um, where you're listening and trying to really gain some perspective and empathy with, with that other person. Um, and deliberation would be the vetting of ideas. Um, that would be where maybe we bring families together and they start kind of hashing out, well, how will this land get divided? How will we um, both be fair and equitable for all family members? Um, the reflection piece is, is really one where we look at not just uh, kind of following up with participants, but it's one that's, that, that we actually ask participants to think about how they know things um, and why they know things and reflect on that. And through that process, um, uh, they're, they're transformed in, in how they see things and through that transformation, um, that's when behavior change can occur or action can occur. Um, that whole model is based on transformer, transformational learning theory by Jack Mazero. Um, and in the, um, uh, you know, in the handout on collaborative learning framework, um, there are some references if people want to read more deeply. In the lower left of the screen, you'll see that there's a couple of Z links or, or shortened links to a couple of things. One is that curriculum framework. If you've got that, um, it'd be handy to keep that up because we'll be delving more deeply into this um, over the next uh, 15 minutes and then we'll break up and, and kind of talk about this in small groups. But uh, if someone really wants to know how this framework was developed, um, this framework was developed um, as part of um, the work I did for dissertation project. Um, I was looking at transformational learning within a collaborative process. 
and um, that that curriculum frame video link um, will will give you some background on the project I worked on. Uh, it's a 20 minute video. So at this point, we're going to stop sharing our screen and 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 um, Becky and I can go ahead and, and we're just going to have a quick conversation. And, and Mark, we've got a few number of participants. I'd, I'd suggest if people want to go ahead and jump in and ask questions while we're going along, um, that this would be a time they can unmute and do so. Yeah, if, if so. folks, yeah, I was going to say, right, uh, and just, just so everyone knows, if this is your first time using Zoom, uh, down, down the lower left-hand corner of your screen, you should have a mute button. Uh, I think, from what I can see, everyone is on mute now, which, which is good. Your, your etiquette is, is, is proper. Uh, but, yeah, if you want to ask a question or join the conversation, uh, if you'll just sort of find a good, uh, again, I think, um, I think Mike and Becky are going to have a bit of a conversation now, but just sort of, they'll, they'll pause at, at certain times, just uh, whenever you're comfortable, if you have a question or would like to make a comment, feel free to unmute yourselves and uh, j join the conversation. Okay, thanks, Mark. And, and if, is, if anybody's got any questions or comments now, this would be a great time before maybe Becky and I get into some examples from our curriculum and how they fit within this framework. Just while we're waiting on others, I it was just I was just thinking about what type of what type of your courses or curriculums do you think would fit in this framework? Do, do you think it applies to all, or are there maybe certain types that are going to lend itself to fitting in this framework, whereas uh, some uh, uh, some others might not? Yeah, Mark, I I think um, that that's a great question, and I think where this framework really fits is is when we're dealing with. Um, issues that are what I would call ill-defined. You know, they don't have one right answer. Okay. And so we might be working with a group or a community group on, on there, there's multiple right answers. So how do we take people through a process? I often like to think about educational processes. You know, we, we, we can teach about creating awareness of, to, to take action on something. Um, but the step after that, once people are aware that they need to take action, they need to they need to decide what action to take. And, and it's, it's those types of things where this, this framework, I think, is most helpful. When we don't exactly know what action should be taken, and, the, and there's multiple actions that would apply. And so it's kind of bringing a group of people to a collective consensus around the action to take. Great. Right, and thinking of just the family environment and the systems model where we are not in isolation that whether we're in a household or family and thinking of finances in particular and resources uh, input from many would be ideal but this might be a technique to gather that input in a non-threatening way where ideas can be shared and then decisions can be made because we're all affected by everything around us um, our household and family, um, our near home environments, and our society, et cetera, and it expands outwards. So I know in the family and consumer science area, this could be applied towards many content areas. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, Becky, um, do you wanna, mm -hmm. we just walk through some examples from the curriculum framework and, and what we do with it, with it for the land transfer. So Becky, you want to start with oh, project yes, focus? Oh yes, I'd be happy to. So one of the areas is the project focus. And our example, of course, illustrates the ongoing process that's so important. But it might be as simple as providing um, a consistent welcome to participants, having introductions, an overview, and some of those beginning points that can really set the stage for what the project is about. And Mike, could you provide some specifics on this? Sure, um, and, and Mark, it occurs to me it'd be great to do a poll now, but we're not going to. Um, I, I use, when I'm look, thinking about project focus and, and what is the purpose of the educational program, whatever it is, I try to break this down into what um, some other researchers, Wiggins and McTie, they're, they're, they're researchers that are more well known for K through 12 education. And, and they look at what are the big ideas. So in, so in family communication, you know, when we're doing land transfer, we're, we're really thinking about um, 
trying to improve family communication or give give families the tools to communicate about a very difficult issue for some. You know, you think about family uh, land transfer, it's, it's, you know, the, the parents own the property and we're trying to encourage communication between the parents and, and the next generation when the next generation don't want to talk about this because they don't want to see their parents. Uh, you know, it means they're talking about the death of their parents. Um, and so this is not a comfortable conversation for many folks. Um, but but we, we really do want to focus on that family communication because what we do know from, from this type of work is that if that communication doesn't happen at the beginning, um, that next generation, maybe there's three or four kids involved um, and it's land, but one of the kids needs money more than it, more than that that uh, participant needs land and um, to get the money the rest of the people involved have to sell the property and so this property gets subdivided and we lose those those benefits to society and 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 quite frankly to the family that the parents were hoping for and so um, family communication becomes kind of the big idea here and what we look at we're really focusing on how do we create um, what Wiggins and Matai call more empathy and and um, perspective you know how can people have different perspective on things um, and, and we'll we'll talk about one of the tools we use um, here in a little bit but um, Becky there's a there's an article I'm going to go ahead and put the um, this in chat Great. so that people can get this link. Um, Great, thank you. Yes, we have Marlene Stum, who is with the University of Minnesota, and she's an extension specialist and professor in family social science, and has been very much involved with the Who Gets Grandma's Yellow Pie Plate program, in which she was, she's an author, et cetera, along with others nationally. But she wrote an article that we've highlighted here, Families and Inheritance, Tips for Planning Ahead, in that, as Mike mentioned, it's a very complicated, complex process to jumpstart communication, for example. And this simple article can be a real tool to assist as well in that looking at it's a benefit to start planning early and that it can actually increase um, communication and lessen conflict and actually create more choices um, for families as they go forward and make decisions about their resources. Grandma's Yellow Pie Plate focuses on the non-titled property, but we find that there's a nice parallel with titled. And that, so if we can bring people together and talk, communicate, uh, they would have ultimately more satisfaction, even if everything doesn't go their own way. So it's a great resource if you're not familiar with it, and it's available, you can just Google it online even, or through our website, and find additional information. So it's a very important piece and talks about the process. Okay. So, um I'm going to go ahead and talk yes. a little bit about um, local knowledge and expert knowledge, Becky. Right. This is one of my personal favorite ideas from all the uh, trainings, workshops that we've conducted in that individuals can't help but share their stories. And so you can just go away from any of our workshops and just even remember the families and who attended and some of the informal outcomes of this education. And I'd like to, just to highlight the importance of local knowledge and expert knowledge and just helping to inform. And there are three stories I would just like to um, highlight from memory, but the one is the family of 17 that I mentioned earlier. And of course, the multi-generational piece there. It was fascinating when you saw 17, I mean, very impactful. And uh, we still remember it to this day and it happened in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. So, um, but very uh, nice family. And for them, it helped bring key players to the table in which to have this discussion. Another story would be, um, we'll title it Betty's Family, 
But in this one, again, a large family, but certain members were selected to attend the workshop. And then from there, uh, it's taken time. Um, any action of planning was not immediate, but it just happened through six years. And then currently we're hearing that there was actual major decision making and a plan that was formed. And then to mention Mike's family, I remember that because his mother came to one of our workshops and um, his, his father as well. And use of technology, both I should say in person and another one through technology. But here's an example how it may not be easy to have representation from the family members due to distance, um, many reasons. And so technology can be a tool, a vehicle, to bring people together for those conversations and therefore less conflict, um, more satisfactory outcomes. So the storytelling is very rich with this content area and they, the anecdotal stories can actually uh, be in the terms of outcomes uh, to show what difference the education would make. So local knowledge and then going on to expert knowledge that we have invited professionals to our workshops uh, to share their expertise. For example, an attorney that is for every workshop we've had, uh, she has been invited and has accepted to share her knowledge, etc. Any other input on expert? Um, both expert knowledge back and back a little bit to the local, mm -hmm. you know, how do we get families to talk? Um, Becky, you, you, you mentioned that, that we do use technology much like this Zoom meeting that we're doing now mm -hmm. um, to bring family members that can't travel across the country to be in a face-to-face -face meeting to be part of it, to hear what, what the experts say when we bring them in. But also with, with these new technologies, uh, the, the, the Zoom meetings, that, that we're, you know, where we can break out rooms. Um, we're, we're looking at using this technology in our, our, our family, um, you know, for families to go ahead and have those meetings um, as part of our workshops in the future. So um, the last three elements, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and just take dialogue. Um, you know, we, we provide time for families to engage in dialogue. Um, one of the ways we do this, and I may be jumping ahead or, or have introduced this before, is we use uh, a tool from Oregon State University called the Heirloom Scale. It's, um, you know, one might be the property is only a financial asset and 10 is that it's, it's a precious heirloom. And so we have families pick where they are, individual members of the family pick where they are. They, they then sit down and discuss that. Um, we have heard from our participants that that tool alone, they keep bringing that back up. They, they use it <coughs> to bring family members in who aren't there. <coughs> and it, it's been very, very effective at, at improving or, or you know, contributing to family communication. And then, you know, that helps them. <clears throat> Once they know where everybody is at and they have that perspective, they can move on to developing a plan of action or deliberating on, on plans of action. And how do they make this fair and equitable for everybody involved? And so, um, you know, the final piece is, is throughout this whole process, we try to build in time for people to reflect on, on their own experience then share that experience with others, um, connect that to, you know, how is it that they know certain things um, because we know that that process can lead to, to behavior change. So, so at this point, what Mark, what we were going to do if we had enough people or have enough people is, is do two breakouts. Is there enough people? Yeah, to I'd, do I'd like to give it a shot if you don't mind. We've got, we've got less than 10. We've got about eight, but we'd have four per, per room. And um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to give it a try if, 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 if you are all up, up, are up for it. I am. So if we can go ahead and do that, but maybe before we break out, let me go ahead and, and kind of describe what we're going to do in these breakout rooms. Um, I want everybody in the breakout room. For, so the first thing we want to do is go ahead and introduce yourselves to each other. 
Um, Becky and I will be in one of the groups. You know, Becky and I are sitting here in the same yeah. room. We we just happen to work in the same mm -hmm. office, so this this has worked out really well. But um, I, I'm assuming we will all have live audio, and if your live audio isn't working, go ahead and use chat to share group uh, your thoughts within the group. Your chat will probably go out to, to everyone, but chat's um, the tool we have. We're going to break out for um, 12 minutes, Mark, is what we'll do. So okay. we'll do a 12 minute breakout. Um, we, we want someone within that breakout group to go ahead and, and be the lead, the timekeeper. So once we get into the breakouts, we've got 12 minutes. Um, we want someone else to go ahead and kind of uh, take notes because there'll be a report out at the end and we want that person to be the one reporting out. And so um, what we'll be asking you to do and what we'll be asking you to report out on are this. We want to, you to imagine an educational program designed to help families. Um, you know, maybe it's, that's an example, but imagine your curriculum, whatever it is, your audience. Um, and it could be imagining an educational program designed to help families with their finances or designed to help families do land transfer or other things. And as a group, discuss how your educational program fits or doesn't fit within this collaborative curriculum framework and what you do that, that fits within there. What we'd like you to report out on is to select one of the elements of this framework, one of those six elements that you found most interesting and describe how your group might use it to foster learning. Okay, so. And now my mic, is that in the, the slides? Um, the like the final slides that you sent me or, or those things that you just shared or those? They aren't. What I can do is I can drop that report out um, I can put that in a chat. Okay, I was going to say, just so if people need to reference it right. during the... Uh... So I'm going to put out what you're going to report out on. I'm going to type that in. What we'll do, Mike, while you're typing that is I'll I'll make sure I'm in one of the other rooms and um, I can sort of facilitate at least having folks introduce them themselves and then hopefully we'll um, we can go from there. So. Okay. There, that should be a select one of the elements of the framework that you found most interesting and how your group would foster learning around that element. And just so we're clear about the elements, so the elements are going to be the, the program focus, research-based knowledge, reflection, deliberation, local knowledge, and dialogue? Uh, dialogue and, and reflection, yep, yep. Okay, good. So right. I'm going to uh, put the framework for people who don't have it. They can link to it. Um, I've got that link hand if you want me to put that in chat. I should have it right there. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. There you go. Should be right there. All righty. Okay, folks. So we are going to go into breakout rooms now. And again, again, we'll ask you to, when we get started, the first thing we'll ask you to do is everyone unmute themselves. And uh, I know there's at least maybe one person on that, that looks like they don't have an audio connection but uh, for the rest of us we'll, we'll sort of see see how it goes and then uh, we'll do that for 12 minutes and then we'll come back in the room so uh, here we go now mark I'm not sure what to expect we're going to be in a room yeah and can, can you hear me still I can okay so I'm gonna so I get to join breakout group one how nice right. that we can be with our librarian. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lurking just to get some best practices from y'all. <laughs> All right, folks, have, have we got started? I was just going to move, sort of move from room to, to room. Um, has, has everyone been able to introduce themselves? Um, I don't know if we've heard from Chris Tiles. Okay. Uh, yep, I'm here. Oh, okay. hi. <laughs> I'm I'm with uh, University of Wisconsin Extension. Oh, oh, hello, Chris. What area do you work in? Uh, forestry. Forestry. So I, I we're under the um, 
name Mary Jo Catris, but Trish Olson is here. We're double. We're just sending as one. But <laughs> and you're from and, University of Minnesota. Yeah. Oh, okay. I work in the Center for Family Development. Oh, awesome. And I'm Kristen Mastel. I'm at the University of Minnesota, but the libraries, I'm the librarian for extension. Ah, cool. And of course, I'm Mark Locklear. I'm hosting the webinar. So I've, I've got some ideas about the framework, but if, if, uh, would someone mind sort of being the, the leader of our group and they, they're the ones that would, they that person could sort of take notes and then do the reporting back out when we go back into the main room. Any volunteers? I can do that. Be my name's out up there. I'm Trish Olson. So I'll do that. Wonderful. Okay. So what time mark do we have to be back? So I think 12 minutes is what they said. And then in fact, I will start my timer on my handy iPhone here. <laughs> I'm going to do the same thing. So. Yeah. And in fact, I'll, I'll do 10, 10 minutes because we, yeah. we've been right. chatting for a minute or so. So I, I just set the timer for 10. So I'll, I'll let folks know when we've reached that okay. point. Okay. Sounds good. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. So can I just ask, uh, sorry, it's Mary Jo and Trish, you guys are both with the family, sorry, say that again? Family Develop Center for Family Development. So we're colleagues of, of Becky, Becky okay. presenting. Yeah. So are you, do you guys then use the grandma's yellow pie plate curriculum? Uh, yeah. 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 Oh, okay, awesome. So I've started to do some uh, succession planning. In fact, I was, I'm, uh, nagging Mike right now to share his curriculum with me. <laughs> um, but then obviously locally in Wisconsin, I do rely quite a bit on the grandma's yellow pie plate. Um, and I, I, for me, I think the biggest part of this is the dialogue. Um, but I'd be curious if you guys have perspective on dialogue and maybe generate from the perspective of uh, older generations it, it tend to be more um, top-down decision-making and when you're engaging in dialogue it's really about listening to the other people without inserting your own opinion necessarily right away and so when we're talking about what should happen with the property I wonder to what degree dialogue um, works well in those situations where some people are just used to making the decision and being done with it. Right. So, so if there was parents and children involved that the children might look, this is Mary Jo, uh, might look to their parents to make those decisions traditionally, but maybe when you're taking on this, this framework, the dialogue might be more equal um, or it might want people to be more equal in those decision-making um, in the decision-making process, whereas before, that's not how the family actually um, worked together in terms of their family. Yeah, exactly. I think it, in my experiences, this is Trish, the dialogue, the challenges of dialogue are really a, across siblings, more than between generations. Mm, that's interesting. Because I think siblings or their spouses have a very different perspective and so getting this across siblings I think one of the beauties of this project is actually getting siblings to talk about that sometimes uh, the parents the elder generation wants to talk about it and the siblings don't don't want it resolved because they have such different ideas of how it should go it's just better to ignore it but I, I don't know if anyone else has had on that experience interesting yeah, and I just, you know, thinking about this too, I wonder, someone talked about the the uh, the equality point, the fact that, okay, maybe in the past everyone was on the same level, or maybe the, the parents are in the, um, you know, the parents sort of have control over things, whereas this conversation is not about that. And I'm wondering if, uh, and it'd be interesting, I don't know if Mike has an idea, if at this point when you're implementing a curriculum like this, is everyone on the same level, including the parents should they be or at that point should the parents sort of hand the things over to the kids and just let the kids make the the decision or or, or is there or should it be a conversation between parents and and siblings uh -huh. so, so the other oh, go ahead i was just gonna say so maybe if, if mike or becky have tools to help facilitate or ground rules for that dialogue 
um, and kind of setting the stage. I don't know if, if they do or not, but um, that would be a good question to ask. So, sorry, Chris, what were you going to say? Oh, I, I was just going to add too, I think what we've seen a lot, and, and I see this with my own family, is that siblings tend to not have adult experiences together, especially if the family is spread out. So the minute you ask them to have dialogue with each other, they revert to however they were. <laughs> so my brother and I get together. This is no joke. I'm in my 40s. My brother's about to be 40. We get together and we're giving each other noogies and wedges. I was just going to say the very same thing. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's like, how do you get people to have adult conversations about very serious topics and getting into some potentially really touchy topics about your finances and where you are and whether you can, particularly from the woodland side of things, but um, you know, how can you afford to keep the property or do you have a real strong need for cash and how does that play into that conversation? And so you're asking people who are giving each other nuggies and, we nuggies and wedgies to have these adult conversations. So it's <laughs> interesting. And that's, you know, I'm just, again, I'm just sort of referring back to the framework document he shared. I think the, the reflection part might be a good part, a good uh, part of the answer to that question is if people are sort of taking a reflective tone, then uh, maybe leave some of that old stuff behind or some of the, the baggage, because I think a big part of this, everybody's going to bring some kind of uh, baggage, sometimes positive, sometimes negative into the, the conversation. So maybe the reflection part helps with that some. Also that there may be a two-step process. How much of this curriculum allows for the uh, parents to implement their desires and wishes, their succession, okay? But once parents are gone, then the children have to determine what's their plan, right? And so while um, you'll say uh, parents might think, I think it's beautiful harmony to have co-ownership of this land between two or three siblings. Um, and then, then, you know, that, that happens. And then, then the reality comes when three people own it and then taxes are due or upkeep is needed or, you know, some kind of, you know, whatever is done with, you know, it, 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 and, you know, I think of one situation where one, um, one of the siblings died. And then um, the in-law now was the owner and the others didn't think he should be owner. Plus he had financial issues so that they were going to lose a property because <laughs> you know, complexity of having joint ownership is um, not all that it's cracked up to be. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, and the other piece I thought about this, you guys, I think, or somebody mentioned they were part of some family groups. I'm assuming some fam from some uh, counseling type uh, from a counseling type background, like at what point do you feel qualified or not qualified to lead a group like this? And like, at what point are you saying, okay, this is out of my, my realm, right, yeah. especially when you're talking about family conflicts and things like that, like where's the line between, okay, you, sh you guys should be seeing a therapist or somebody like that versus, Very um, true. yeah. No, yeah. Good point. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Kristen, is any of this resonating with with your with your experiences? <laughs> Family dynamics? What? <laughs> I don't have any of that. But um, I just find the curriculum framework really interesting. Obviously, being a librarian, I'm more on the left hand column. Like mm -hmm. people are coming to me needing um, usually around research based knowledge, but I'm all, always trying to figure out how to tap into their like local and prior knowledge first to hook them. Um, and when teaching, if I can build in reflection and all, um, I think that that makes a stronger takeaway message. But yeah, the whole property thing, I'm, that's all in your hands. Thank goodness I don't have to deal with that. <laughs> Right. But I just okay. I, I haven't seen this type of framework before, so I thought it was really interesting. Yeah. All right, I'm looking at the other breakout room, and I think we've all folks have went okay. back in, in, into the main room. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to click click the magic button, and we'll all go back into the main room now. Hello, Mark. We are back. Good. Well, we're, we we left with ten people. We have seven now. 
Okay, yeah. So we we lost someone, but we had a we had a robust uh, conversation on, on on our side, and I think Trish was the the leader of our group, and she she agreed to report out. So, okay. however, we want to. If I don't know if your group wants to report out first or. Well, let's wait until Trish joins us. It doesn't look we're like. Under, we're, under, uh, we're we're both under. This is Mary Jo Cotters. Trish is hiding under my name. <laughs> ah, okay, Mary Jo. I, I'm being very stealth here. <laughs> it's that it's that witness protection program that I'm under. I got it. Um, I, I'm happy to report on it. And I'll just kind of make it short and sweet. But we we did focus quite a bit on um, the complexities of family dynamics and all the history that you come with. That as that in a, as adults now we revert back to some perhaps childish behavior of how we used to communicate and maybe still do communicate with our siblings. Um, and also, I think we had some questions. We had questions around um, how much is this about shared ownership of decisions or is it about uh, an, um, the elders sharing their decisions with others or how is this a co-decision? And maybe there's multiple answers to this. And also, when do you know that you need to refer that family onto um, more professionals who help with family dynamics in a counseling setting versus having that kind of dribble into this or or maybe even um, flood into this conversation well those are those are really yeah. good good questions um, you know I, I can tell you from our perspective and experience so far you know Becky's and mine within you know ten years now working on land transfer and 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 we are really in ten years um, that you know we we have found that bringing families together sometimes for the first time in the workshop has has been very valuable for the families i i think it's been we, we've been really fortunate to have that expert presentation by an attorney who can who 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 has been through this as a family member herself so she she knows that 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 there are different family dynamics and and um, to answer that specific question this is this is really the 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 older generation the owners of the property are making decisions about how to keep the land intact because that's what they would like to see um, but but they're also trying to balance that you know what is fair and what is equitable um, dividing it evenly isn't always the right thing um, and it's it's trying to work through that process to where everybody can see themselves in in a role with with the land. Um, some of the, some of the family members say, "No, I don't want it. I live too far away," and that's happened within our groups. Um, but it's to bring out those conversations so that so that everybody can see those different perspectives and then begin to work through a process to where they can recognize that there are those differences, and because of those differences, they're mm -hmm. important enough to begin looking at how to divide this land up um, or, or pass it on and keep it intact from different perspectives. When do you need to bring in somebody else? Um, we, we in our presentation will, will say that, you know, you may need a facilitator in these family meetings um, so that you, you don't just revert back to high school and talk to each other like you did, you know, the kids did when they were in high school but the facilitator can help them through that process. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I think it's making those tools available to the families is really important in that, in that dialogue process. Right, and as part of the workshop, uh, participants did receive who gets grandma's yellow pie plate, so they have a workbook where they can at least get a start on looking at what fairness is, any conflict, but no, their counseling, you know, anything like that, it has not been a part of what we do. We'd more or less set the stage for the conversations and communication. And if there is further need, as Mike said, that, you know, facilitator roles and other may be appropriate. But uh, we do have the legal representation as a part of our workshop. But great questions. So. And so we'll report out. I think we've got probably about three minutes left. Is that right, Mark? Looks like it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we can we can report out and then wrap up. Um, 
And so you were going to just quickly report okay. out on this. This it was it was more on on yes. conversation on finances. Right, actually, it came out with that and looking at financial education. And um, Jane mentioned in particular uh, looking at dialogue on the uh, framework and looking at the importance of listening and taking time to just encourage that communication process so the dialogue piece and and it came out you know how can we encourage our audiences to be present for education sometimes everyone's so busy it's hard to capture who uh, may be of interest or uh, need, has need for the education so dialogue was the main point of our discussion okay so um just to, to wrap up, I, I, I do want to thank everybody for joining. I see Chris Tiles on, and I wanted to recognize her. I think I've said Kristen Nestel. I recognize that. Chris, I've, I've got some things I promised to get you. I will be getting those to you. Um, is there any other questions at this point on the model? Uh, kind of a you know 10,000 foot level view of, of what we do within the land transfer program or any other specific questions before we close out and just say don't forget I think we've got one more poll to one more poll thank you Mark yes I had forgotten that I was trying to get back to my uh, my cue sheets but um, I was going to share my screen again was I was I not Mark um, I actually don't don't recall if that was um, that was the I don't plan. know if I need to but, yeah, I was say, unless you feel like there's some compelling content um, I don't need to we've got two poll questions one is on uh, how likely is it that you might use this curriculum framework and and how engaging did you find the webinar format to be and uh, just as a reminder to folks again the learn event um, the uh, a copy of the recording will be available at the learn event uh, within a few days and then also all of the handouts that Mike referenced here uh, Will, will be available at the learning event. So feel free to go back and rewatch it if you'd like, or certainly share it with friends or colleagues who were not able to join us. And I'm going to share, I'll share the poll results now. Okay, so it looks like the uh, curriculum framework, somewhat likely or very likely, uh, and moderately to very engaging. I hope that was higher than a traditional webinar format. Yeah, I enjoyed doing this, Mark. I really yeah. Listen, I was. This is the first time, and just again, thank you for everyone on the call. This is the first time I've actually used. I've used breakout rooms, just sort of playing playing around in a uh, in experimental setting. But this was the sort of first live one that we've did, and I was, I was pleasantly surprised with how well. It, how well everything went and the, the engagement thank you for uh, engaging and just be, being a part of the conversation when you do a webinar like this you're always worried that no one's going to want to talk or share and uh, everyone at least the folks in, in my room were were, 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 uh, were very willing to, to share so that I think it went well yeah thank you everyone okay. all right nothing more on my end any any any, any closing thoughts um, I, thanks everybody. I've, I've learned some stuff and and will apply it to the work that Becky and I are doing. All right, great. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Bye bye. Thank you.